So good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Our theme for 2015 has been even deeper. And a personal intention that I've had with that theme for this year is that every day this year, I want to have that experience of going even deeper. Uh, but I have to remind myself sometimes, yeah. deeper, deeper into what? <laughs> oh, a, a half gallon of ice cream, check. <laughs> deeper into debt, I've done that a little bit too. But what I mean by even deeper is really delving deeper into who I am. Really having an even deeper experience of, of life, of consciousness. I don't even want to mean it in, a, in an ultra kind of hunky-dory way of I want to be happier every day or even wiser every day because my life doesn't work that way. But I do think I can be a little bit more mindful or feel a little bit more grounded in awareness of what is every day. That, that feels like a reasonable goal to me. And I think that one of the things that happens is when we go even deeper into ourselves, we realize how much more there is to us than we thought. So one of the first realizations I have in going even deeper into myself is that I'm not a singular thinker pushing buttons and choosing one thought at a time. I'm a whole population of thoughts, beliefs, experiences, and ideas vying for my attention. And one of the things that we begin to discover when we go even deeper within ourselves is we discover certain polarities between ourselves, things that are called to want to be brought into greater balance. So I realize, for example, that I have conscious thoughts and beliefs that I'm aware of, but there's also the unconscious <coughs> thoughts and beliefs, that term unconscious popularized by Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, Ernest Holmes, the founder of Science of Mind, referred to it as the subjective. And so going even deeper into this understanding means, yes, being aware of my conscious thoughts, but also all of those thoughts, beliefs, and ideas that I'm unaware of and how they affect things like my body or my psychology or my relationships or my actions. It's important to understand in this delving deeper as well that we realize that all the things in the unconscious aren't negative. They don't need to be bad. Carl Jung would teach in particular that there's some, some gold deep down in those tunnels to be mined, to be realized. It's also important to understand that the idea isn't to glare ourselves so where we're shining lights on all parts of ourselves. It's okay that some things remain in the shadow or remain in the dark. As Carl Jung would say very poetically that there are some flowers that blossom only in the night. And there are aspects of our soul and our being that are like that. So it's quite an adventure going even deeper into ourselves. Would you resonate with that? You're an exciting person. I'm an adventurer. <laughs> Another one of these polarities that I think that we discover when we move even deeper within ourselves is often what we refer to as the balance between the masculine energy and the feminine energy within ourselves. The yin-yang energy. Traditionally, traditionally, masculine spirituality is associated with, with action, with doing, with realizing individuality and freedom, and realizing one's role in society and fulfilling it. Ancient sculptures often show man in a uniform, in a costume, fulfilling a social role. Women, however, normally in ancient times appear naked, not just because they're beautiful, but because their focus and their spirituality is much more based on the groundedness of nature and being authentically what one is. Female spirituality can generally be associated with creativity, not just bringing into form, but evolving what is. The female energy is a transformative energy that is grounded in all of nature and all of spirit is the energy of causality. <coughs> now it's really important to understand, I found in my own life, that it's not just if you're a male that you really have a lot of masculine energy or if you're a female, you really have a lot of female energy. You only need to listen to a Bruce Jenner interview to understand how it crystallizes 
with clarity in a good way these things can be. The truth is, is that these energies are in all of us and they go together. You can't have one without the other. So learning to find a balance of them in our own individuality is an important aspect of going even deeper, delving deeper into our own lives and ourselves. And I want to focus on feminine spirituality all this month, yes, because it's Mother's Day and things like that, but mostly because in our human history, we've in many cases repressed femininity. We've subjugated it. We've often uh, discriminated against it. And so there's something about bringing awareness in particular to the female tradition of spirituality that I can think can help us find greater balance and a greater sense of being and creativity in our lives. We've certainly in many ways seen the repression of femininity in the world, and I won't delve too much into it, but there's a, a great book several years ago that came out by an author named Nicholas Kristof called Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide. And what makes the book so good is the support he actually gives to amazing facts that he finds, like the following. He says, it appears that more girls have been killed in the last 50 years precisely because they were girls than men were killed in all the wars of the 20th century. Whoa, right? More girls are killed in this routine gender side in any one decade than people were slaughtered in all the genocides of the 20th century. So we have a real problem in the world, not just in Africa and Asia, but everywhere, with how we honor the female role. He says also, in the 19th century, the central moral challenge was slavery. In the 20th century, it was the battle against totalitarianism. We believe that in this century, the paramount moral challenge will be the struggle for gender equality around the world. And that resonates, but these are some big facts, these big ideas, which speak not only to the repression of femininity in the world, but to the idea that it ultimately is founded within the repression of the feminine within our own being. And that by beginning to embrace the feminine and male aspects of our being, we can learn not only to bring our own lives into harmony, but to support others around us in living in that harmony too. I remember as a school child, and I'm sure even beyond that, playing with my male friends, and we would make fun of each other by saying, stop acting like a girl, or you sissy, things like that. But what I remember as well, as offensive as what we were saying was, when a girl or a woman did walk into the room, we didn't think she was a sissy, we were in awe. <laughs> Check her out, what a mystery. <laughs> so although what we were saying would have definitely been offensive to a girl walking in, we didn't mean to really ascribe those qualities to her. They were really the result of the repression and the criticism of ourselves, of repressing that feminine nature in ourselves. So we, although we weren't discriminating against other girls then, I think I could speak for my friends too, as we got older, and we continue to repress that energy within us, that's where sometimes that discrimination can get started. 10,000 years ago, scholars believe that there was a statue that was made. It's been discovered in the last 100 years. It was discovered in what is now Turkey. And it's of a, a double woman in the sense that there's two of the same woman and they're back to back. On one side, She's carrying a baby. On the other side, she's cradling a grown man. Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, speaks to this statue and the idea of how it's a signpost to the transformative energy of the feminine, the great feminine power. He tells us, here is a principal mythological role of the feminine principle. She gives birth to us physically, but she is the mother, too, of our second birth, our birth as spiritual entities. This is the basic meaning of the motif of the virgin birth, <coughs> that our bodies are born naturally, but at a certain time there awakens in us a spiritual nature, which is the higher human nature, not that which simply duplicates the world of the animal urges of erotic power drives in sleep. That sounds like me sometimes. Instead, there awakens in us the notion of a spiritual aim, a spiritual life, 
an essentially human, mystical life to be lived above the level of food, of sex, of economics, pol politics, and sociology. In this sphere of the mystery dimension, the woman represents the awakener, the giver of birth in that sense. I like that, where the feminine energy is the awakening energy. It is the transformational energy. We even look at this idea of the virgin birth, and religion, as I'll talk about in a moment, is one of the greatest suppressors of the female energy, but we realize that even the Christ can't come about. It must come through a woman, through that feminine energy to be born. One of the biggest problems we've had in our culture, and one reason why the subjugation of women takes place, is that religion has learned over time, unfortunately in many ways, to repress the feminine. It hasn't always, because the truth is, is almost every creation myth I can think of has a female at the very center of it. At the very center. But what happens is men who subjugated the feminine within themselves, they start telling these myths in a way that sometimes make the female to be the villain or the mistaken. But the great thing about myth is when you realize that it's not history, that it's there to tell a true story, a spiritual story, you can learn not to always retell the myth, but to dig deeper into it and find a greater truth. The most common creation myth and often accepted myth in our culture is the Adam and Eve creation myth. It's not the only creation myth in the Bible, but it's an essential one. It's right there. And it speaks to the idea of Adam being the first being, and then Eve being created from his rib. Now, a lot of us were taught that that means that woman comes second to man. That without a man, you wouldn't have a woman. And so, woman should come in second place. But can't we also see an idea that women is an evolution of man? Mm -hmm. That she's actually not necessarily a step up, but that the feminine energy is how man evolves from being just in that earthly energy, that type of even erotic energy that Campbell was speaking to, just being really physical. That it's with women, perhaps, that feminine energy, that he begins to have self-consciousness. That he begins to be aware of something other than himself, that we as humankind begin to grow. And again, this isn't history because you have to have the energies together. And then, when you see the myth in that way, you can see that perhaps Eve's eating of the fruit off of, and I have a visual here. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that perhaps, perhaps Eve's eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge and good an evil was something that she was really called to do. That even though God said, if you eat of this fruit, you will have to leave this paradise, this garden, perhaps there was something that he knew she was capable of that Adam wasn't. To eat of the true of life, truth of life, to begin to understand the opposites and to begin the human path of bringing these sides together. Eve's story is all of our story, just like Adam's story is. Our book of the month is called Paradise in Plain Sight, Lessons from a Zen Garden. It's by a woman named Karen Miller, and it's a real powerful book, and I bring it up in relation to the Eve myth, because it speaks to a different understanding of the idea of paradise, or of the garden. In the book, she talks about buying a property in L.A. kind of impulsively because it had this beautiful Japanese garden in it. But after she purchased it, she realized that it's beautiful to look at, but hell to take care of. <laughs> to nurture and take care of this garden. But one of the ways she centered and comforted herself was with the following. She said, one day I ran across a single line in a thick book that made it all simple. I, it told the original meaning of the word paradise before it became a mythical ideal, imaginary and unattainable, before it pointed somewhere else. The word paradise originally meant an enclosed area. Inside the word are its old Persian roots, peri, meaning around, and dies, to create a wall. The word was first given to carefully tended pleasure parks and menageries the sporting ground of kings. 
Later, storytellers used the word in creation myths and it became to mean the Eden of peace and plenty. Looking at it straight on, I could plainly see paradise is a backyard. Not just my backyard, but everyone's backyard. Teeming with weeds, leaves, half-dead trees, moles, mosquitoes, mud, dust, skunks, and raccoons. Like the entire world we live in, bounded only by how far we can see. And this statement speaks to me to the power of the feminine energy. Because we're all, in a sense, managing a paradise. And it's not designed to be perfect. It's designed to explore. It's designed for us to find more about ourselves. It's designed for each of us, in a sense, to eat of its fruits, no matter what the consequences, to open ourselves up and to expand what paradise or living life can mean. Another important creation myth, not as dominant today, but it used to be very dominant, especially in the Greek mythos, is the Greek creation story of, of women. The female, again, is named Pandora. She's the first female, and she's really what brings the total world we know about. In the myth, man's existed for a while, and Zeus is the thunder god, and he gets pissed at this hero named Prometheus, and he says, I'm really going to get this guy. I'm going to create something evil. I'm going to create something bad. And he creates women. <laughs> And today, those who subjugate the feminine think and agree with Zeus. But man didn't. Man really, really liked woman a lot. <laughs> Pandora was beautiful, and there was something about her, not just physically, but energetically, psychically, something man didn't have for himself yet. So he began to fumble over himself trying to love her, trying to show her affection. Woman was so powerful that even the gods began to fall in love with her, and they started chasing around and giving her everything that was, a, that was around. They even famously gave her a box, right? And as the myth is often told, Pandora's given a box and said, don't open it. That's how we often understand the myth. But the truth is, According to me, we ministers can do that. <laughs> I know no ministers ever you know, use old mythology to try and make points, but this one's going to in this instance. But she's giving this box by man, and it's filled with the knowledge of good and evil. But the reason man give it to her is because they can't open it themselves. See, it takes a woman to make the hard decisions sometimes. <laughs> So Pandora, she's not sure if she wants to open this box because she knows that there's some not good things in there, but she's driven. She has this innocence, but she has this creativity. She has this desire to transform and evolve, too. So she can't really help herself, and she opens it up. And don't worry, nothing's going to fly out. <laughs> there are some cop drops and some sewing materials. <laughs> but famine comes out. War comes out. All of this not good stuff comes out, but all of this life stuff comes out too. That's really important to the polarities that help us realize the truth of who we are. So without Pandora and her wisdom, it doesn't happen. There's one thing that's let out of the box as well, something that's created that never existed before that moment, and we call it today hope. Hope. It's what's at the heart of the feminine spirituality. It's that which never forgets where it really came from. It's that which always remembers the central cause of its life. And even in the myth of Pandora, no matter how challenging things are in the world, the gift of hope is what allows each of us to confront it and move through it no matter what. So it's through embracing the feminine within ourselves that we can return to a sense of the causality of our own being and how we want to create in the world. Joseph Campbell's famous, we're talking about the, the hero. And he said something quite profound. I'm surprised we don't hear about it more often. He said, what is a hero, essentially? The hero isn't someone who has hit 600 home runs in his lifetime. 
This is resonant this week with Alex Rodriguez, who a lot of us don't see necessarily as a hero because of some of his behavior, but he hit over 600 home runs, and people went, meh. <laughs> they did. So he says, the hero isn't someone who has hit 600 home runs in his lifetime. The hero is someone who has given his life for a cause or for others. It speaks to this idea in the society that everyone is a hero, but it's often the male energy that wants to get the credit for it, that wants to be seen for it. But it's the feminine energy of those of us who choose to live for it that choose to be supportive of others in realizing their individuality, in supporting their function in the world, in creating great things. So it speaks to this idea that the causality and transformation of the feminine power helps, in a sense, get us even closer to an understanding of the foundation of the divine in our lives. Another creation myth is the myth of Sophia, and this is in Gnostic lore, which is an early form of Christianity, and they believe in Sophia, which means wisdom. She has a father, mother God, which is the fullness of light, and one day she's out playing, and all there is is this light, but she gets lost, and she can't make her way back to the light, and she's so frustrated, she's so confused, she's in agony, and out of that confusion and agony, a whole universe, our universe, is created. And because she's in agony and confusion, the world and the universe expresses agony, and it expresses confusion. But there's a truth about Sophia being the truth of the light, the truth of the feminine power, and it exists in every human being and in every aspect of life. It all contains a little bit of that light right at the center of its being. So it speaks to this idea of a spirit within all of us that's just trying to get back home, that's just trying to get back to that sense of the light, that's just trying to return to a sense of the fullness and the wholeness, even in confronting or having to move through the agony or the confusion of feeling lost and unknown from home. So the masculine energy is really important, don't get me wrong, but the feminine energy is something that deserves for me, in our day and time, a little bit more emphasis. Not just in giving credit, but in finding that greater balance in ourselves to live a more congruent and harmonious life with who we really are. And when we can embrace who we really are, all aspects of it, rejecting nothing but being mindful and hopefully even a little suspicious, perhaps, of everything, we can start living more sincerely and more accepting of the life that is before us. To speak again to the power of Miller's writing, she says, everyone has a path in life, including the spiritual aspect of life. And the good thing is, you don't have to find it. You are already on it, fully equipped for the trip. The path you are on always leads you further on, in the same way you were led here today. To walk the path, you just keep going, asking, seeking, finding. And this is the most important thing, trying. If you haven't yet recognized your path, it's because you haven't gone far enough to see clearly. We have to use our feet to get close enough for anything to come into focus. So just closing prayerfully today, just invite you to join me if you choose, just to become aware of the process of moving deeper within our own psyche, our own spirituality, recognizing that the very act of doing so may seem to create chaos at first. It may seem to let out some disorder into our world. But if we stay committed, hopeful, grounded, in the knowledge of who we really are and what we can be, feeling it not just in our affirmation but in our very body and conviction of existing, I know that we make our way into ourselves and step into the world in a way where the way is shown for us to accept ourselves just as we are, right here and right now, to embody the masculine spirit which says, go get out there, be somebody, make something of yourself, yet balancing that with the recognition of the Divine Mother that embraces us, that accepts us as we are, perfect, beautiful, in the here and now, to take each step in awareness of the Mother's love, 
and of the Father's support is to live in divine alignment with that spirit within and all around us. We let it be in gratitude and we put it to work in our lives. And so it is. Amen. So thanks for your time, everyone.